שלום לכם. דיברנו היום על מדע במחלוקת ציבורית ועל הדרכים בהן אנשים מחליטים לאיזה טיעון מדעי להאמין ובאיזה מומחה או מומחית לבטוח. הרבה מהרעיונות שפגשנו היום צמחו מתחום, מתוך תחום משיק ותיק יותר של תקשורת סיכונים. מהיתרונות הבולטים בהכנת קורס מקוון היא שאנחנו יכולים לדבר עכשיו עם אחד האבות המייסדים של תחום תקשורת הסיכונים, פרופסור ברוך פישוף מהמחלקה להנדסה ולמדיניות ציבורית והמכון לפוליטיקה ולאסטרטגיה באוניברסיטת קרנגי מלון יוניברסיטי. לא אגיע אתכם ברשימת הישגיו, רק אומר שפרופסור פישוף הקים או עמד בראש רבות מהוועדות הרלוונטיות לנושא בארצות הברית בעשרות השנים האחרונות. וכדי שהשיחה בינינו תקלח, אני אעבור עכשיו לאנגלית. שלום ובוקר טוב לפרופסור ברוך פישוף, מהדפרטמנט של אינג'ינירינג ופובליק פוליסי ואינסטיטוט של פוליטיקס ואסטרטגי, קרנגי מלון יוניברסיטי. In your book, Risk, a very short introduction, you write, effective risk communication is essential to society. Why? What happens if risk is not communicated effectively? Uh, then people don't know what what's happening and people don't feel as though they're being treated respectfully and given the information that they need to make good decisions for themselves, their family, and, and for their... their society. So the people who know about the risks have a moral obligation and maybe political necessity to organize the information to, for the public, to convey it to them in authoritative ways, make certain that they're understood and that they're respected. I think you gave us some of the ideas of how can scientists make sure that their risk communication is effective. So be respectful. And make sure that they are being understood what else well making certain that they're relevant that uh, scientists typically communicate uh, with their colleagues or in the classroom about the things that we know and uh, we're often very good in the classroom and not very good with the public because the public is not interested in is only interested in what we know relevant to their people problems and if we give them a uh, fire hose of irrelevant facts uh, uh, even if they're spoken in simple clear language we're not addressing their problems and and in effect not showing respect to them hmm. so the problem of effective risk communication seems to be especially important among educated people a study you conducted showed that individuals with greater science literacy and education have a more polarized beliefs on controversial science topics. Why is that? Um, well, there seem to be several, re several reasons. One is that people who have greater science education or regular education are often more confident in defending their beliefs. Uh, a, a second is that they're more likely to know what their beliefs should be. That is, they're more likely to know what their... Uh, political party or their faith uh, has as what their position is on a particular on a particular topic a third thing um, which was relevant to the to the paper that you that you mentioned is that it reflects results from a survey that somebody else designed that we Caitlin Drummond uh, my former graduate student who did most of the work and I agreed the questions were not very well written. And so better educated people, we think, were better able to figure out what the survey researchers were trying to get at and then to give them the, uh, the party line. <laughs> so what can we do to counteract this phenomenon? Well, I th the people who study communication talk about both the content and the process. So the process... There's a speech act in the process of some a, a bit a bit of jargon, which is that what is what is what is your relationship with the people that you are communicating? Uh, uh, are you only interested in them when they you want them to solve a problem for you or or to get out of your way? or do you have some continuing relationship with their uh, with their community? Um, the relevance of a communication is also a speech act of, of, of sorts because you're, you can only be relevant if you know your, if you know your audience. And it is remarkable how rarely I think communications are um, first analyzed from the perspective of the audience. That is, what do they 
really need to know what's the relevant evidence, how good is that evidence, and then it's also rare for the messages to be tested. And the testing is very simple. The, 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 there's great margin of utility in uh, showing somebody a draft of your message saying, I really want to make certain that this works for, for people. Please read it aloud to me. Tell me whatever comes into your mind. Uh, I'm testing the message, not you. If the tone seems wrong, tell me. If something is missing, tell me. Uh, scientists could greatly improve their communication if they did that simple kind of think aloud protocol, making it clear that they're enlisting somebody from their audience's help in improving the message, not testing their, the, their audience member. Yeah, that, that would be an interesting uh, change of uh, perspective for scientists, that they don't need to test someone if they know they need to test themselves to see that what they do works. Uh, one of our strongest uh, results, maybe it's the, the, the key result in, the, in social psychology is that people exaggerate how well they communicate. That is, they think that they understand their audience better than they actually do, and that they're being understood than they actually, actually are. And uh, I think what, one of the reasons why sometimes scientists are very good in the classroom and not very good with the public is in, in the classroom, you can even if you dictate the curriculum, so you don't really have to be relevant, and you can see if you're getting across or not. You, are the students looking at their cell phones? Are they wrestling paper? Uh, uh, can they answer the, the questions correctly on the exam? Whereas when you're dealing with the general public, you just don't get that, that feedback. So you, you don't have the opportunity to tell how well you're doing and improve your performance. But there's something that we do know, and that's that people use intuition and heuristics to make sense of risks. What does that mean for the quality of our decision making? Well, the, the, the research, which probably will be known to your audience, is research about heuristics and biases. Uh, and it's the heuristics are these generally useful uh, rules of thumb that can lead to biases. We use the biases, as scientists, we look at the biases for their diagnostic value. That is, when things go wrong, there's often few explanations. When things go right, there are often many explanations. That is, I can make a good decision because I've gotten there by painful trial and error, or because somebody who I, whom I trust has given me the right answer, mm -hmm. or I've watched somebody else, else do it. So we study biases, they're front and center for us. Where they occur, they can be really painful, but we really know nothing about the prevalence of bias in everyday, in everyday life. It's actually not a very well-specified uh, question. So people who study biases know what to look for, and sometimes they find them and sometimes they, they, they don't. So I'm, I'm not, uh, not as pessimistic about communicating with, with people as some, some of my colleagues might be. Well, that, that's actually good to hear because, well, when I prepared for this interview, I looked for the World Health Organization uh, definition and uh, ideas about risk communication, and I came across this citation. The ultimate purpose of risk communication is to enable people at risk to take informed decisions to protect themselves and their loved ones. And I felt that based on everything um, I read in the social science uh, uh, literature, it's unclear if evidence-based decision-making in socio-scientific issues really is a realistic goal. Do you think it's a realistic goal for the general public? Well, I, I think our default should be that it's our mission to empower people to make decisions. If we follow the discipline of finding out what's really relevant to people, finding out what they know already, developing and testing messages using our best science, we can see how far we can push that envelope of autonomous decision-making. But if we don't do our job right, then we set people up for failure. And then where the failure is actually ours, we haven't done our, our, job, uh, our, our job right. Well, thank you very much, Professor Baruch Fischoff uh, from the Department of Engineering and Public Policy and Institute of Politics and Strategy. 
at Carnegie Mellon University. It was a pleasure and a privilege to have you with us. Thank you for having me.